Thank you for checking out Value Driven Life. I am your host, host, Coach Chris McMahon, and I am super excited today to get to sit down and chat with Allie Henry. Now, for those of you who don't know Allie, Allie is CEO of AHN Coaching and a registered dietitian who loves pizza, tacos, and anything lemon flavored. But she spent over five years in the weight management industry. She has a ton of experience especially revolving around the concept of behavior change and mindful eating. And I'm just super excited to chat with her. But she also has a three-year-old boy and another boy coming very soon. She currently lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. She loves to cook. She loves movement. And her philosophy is that nutrition and fitness should enhance your life. I agree with you on so many levels. So thank you, Allie, for being here. Yes, thank you for having me. Yes. Yeah, so I, I guess the thing about you is that you popped up on my Instagram feed uh, a couple of months ago. And I don't know if we have maybe mutual friends. Maybe it's uh, I had posted something about maybe something that like Josh Hillis had said, and maybe we crossed paths that way. I don't really know how we got to know each other, but uh, I love all of your content. And I think it's so important for folks to be able to see that and recognize that because it's it, it's a fine line when you work in health and fitness, especially when you work in nutrition, because there's two sides to it. You know, I like to call it, I exist in the messy middle and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you kind of exist in the messy middle too. Um, what is your take on messy middle? How would you even define that for yourself? Oh my gosh, that's totally where I exist. And it's so funny because I even had a client the other day who um, was kind of asking me about intuitive eating and I had made a post about intuitive eating. And she's like, where do you stand? Like, do you not like it? Do you like it? And I was like, I know you want to like put me in this camp, but I'm not, it, it, it's just, it's an approach we can use. Right. And so, uh, that's essentially the messy middle. Uh, the, another conversation I had with a good friend of mine about the messy middle was that it, I like to think of it as a customized approach. Right. So it you know, there's so many different methods we can use to get somebody where they want to go. And there's not going to be one approach that works for everybody across the board. So being able to figure out, you know, pull pieces from different methods and mesh it all together into something that works for one person, uh, it's customized. And it also might mean that they feel like, <laughs> they're breaking some rules, but there are no rules. So it's fine. <laughs> uh, I love that. I really do love that. The idea that there are technically no rules. I think, you know, when we look at the ends of the spectrum, you know, we have the diet culture end and then we have the anti-diet culture end. I can think that the thing that you and I probably agree on is the concept of rules being something that's overly constricting for someone and can produce some maybe eating behaviors or food relationship stuff that can get complicated. So it's really important. And I, I want the listeners to understand this. It's really important to understand that all of the things we're talking about, they're, they're tools in the toolbox and, and every person is going to be different. And it's almost like a red flag. If you're working with someone and you're like, you see that you're doing the exact same thing as someone else and the exact same thing as another person, that's something to be aware of. Um, the thing that I'm really interested to hear about, especially with you being a mom and having another kid on the way and having your own business and family commitments and everything, it's usually when I bring up the term of mindful eating, and maybe you can provide how you see the definition, how you see it with your clients. Mm -hmm. The idea of mindful eating, when I say it with someone, they're like, oh, you mean just eat like really, really slow? <laughs> like really, really slow. Like, how am I supposed to do that? Like, my kid's gonna set the house on fire. Like, how right. are you right? It's like it's like it's almost put into this box of mindful eating is just eating really slow, and that's it, you yeah. know. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that, like how you define mindful eating and how you would approach it, and how you even approach it in your own life when you do have so much going on. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, there's so many. So when I teach my clients mindful eating. I have several different principles that I teach them. And I always tell clients like, you're never going to practice all of these principles all at once. That's not the goal. <laughs> uh, and again, it's like 
tools in our toolbox, right? And so when you can't do one thing, maybe you'll be able to do another thing that will just help you to be more aware. And then the other side of it too, I think when people think of mindful eating, they almost think, yeah, I'm just going to eat slowly and I'm going to savor every bite and be meditative while I'm eating. And I mean, that's, that's not the goal either. I mean, sometimes you just eat and get the job done and move on with your life, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's the nature of life and parenthood and everything like that. So um, finding the, you know, middle ground again, where you are practicing the principles you can and paying attention to what you're eating. Um, that can look like, I mean, I talk to clients about their hunger and fullness cues and learning how to uh, recognize them and then honor them. And then we talk about sitting down, eating from a plate whenever possible, learning how to build a well-balanced plate most of the time, um, eating slowly, or even just like putting your fork down in between bites so you eat a little bit slower. Uh, those are some of the principles that I teach all of my clients. And so I say, okay, you've got all these different tools. And sometimes, yeah, like you might not be able to um, build a balance plate. Maybe you're out to eat or you're at somebody's house and like their options just aren't super like well balanced, but you can still eat slowly. Right. Uh, and you can maybe put your food on a plate, like plate it so you can see how much food you're eating and be aware of that. So there are different things that can help you all along the way. And that's what I like about mind fleeting is that it's so flexible for life. Whereas, and I'm not anti-tracking macros either. Like I have clients that do that, but sometimes people get in situations and they feel like, well, I don't know what to do. Cause I, I can't track. I don't know portion sizes. I'm not measuring, which, you know, you can do that messily as well, but they get kind of stuck. And so having tools with mindful eating, which they can use in conjunction with tracking, they can use totally by themselves. It just kind of helps them to be a little bit more flexible in life because they again have more tools in their toolbox yeah oh i think that that's wonderful i i really love what you're saying like it provides the flexibility for someone who is usually of more of like a rigid a rigid mindset i you know the way i like to view it with clients is the folks who very much enjoy like macros and calorie counting are usually like of a type a personality like they're data very data driven right I, and and the good thing about that is that if you are that type of person, it's very easy to separate yourself from the data point, right? If we could treat it like like you could look at the scale the same way. If you're someone who's just like, no, I just want to notice a trend, then it's very different than someone who's like, I stepped on the scale. This is pointless. I, I equate my work to this, right? It's a very fine line that you walk. So that's why I'm attracted to like mindful eating. And I like to view it as you know, there's a specific set of foundational principles that if we have this established, you know, let's say you lose like one to two pounds in one month. Mm -hmm. That's really amazing. I would consider even like half a pound in a month really amazing because you can kind of look at it from this foundation point that it's like, you never have to worry about that again. Yeah. It's like, I know the principles that I laid to get to this point and they weren't overly restrictive they were just more of like hey let me check in with myself while i'm doing these actions yeah and i love it too because yeah. I, it just helps people trust themselves more and that's a big theme i see across the board especially if people are used to just tracking and i mean i i come from background i tracked for a long time and i really liked it and I've used it. I'll probably use it again in the future. However, what I noticed when I was super reliant on it and I had no other way, no other methods of doing things was I felt like I, I needed it. I couldn't live without it. Right. <laughs> like there was no other option. And so that got tiresome because I was like, well, I don't, I don't want to do this forever and I'm busy and whatever else. So getting to a point where I had other mechanisms and other skills, eating skills, we, we can call it mindful eating eating skills, right? I think that's what Joshua Hillis calls it, but um, that just helps you to have another 
like cue for you. So like my fitness pal would be an external cue. Mindful eating would be your internal cues that you can use so that you don't need an app to tell you what to do all the time. You can yeah. go to a situation and know like, I'm going to make a good decision for myself. I know how to make a good decision for myself. I can trust myself to act in alignment with my values. And that's super empowering for a lot of clients, especially when they're busy. Yeah. Yeah. I really, the thing that stood out for me there is you brought up this concept of like, even for yourself personally, it's like, yeah, I totally, I totally loved calorie and macro track. I loved being, I'm very data. I love that stuff. It's really cool. However, for me, I found that it was like, how can I do this forever? Right. That I think that, in and of itself, Allie, is something that really would register with like a lot of people. Like, how do I do this forever? Like that is, and there is one part of it where it's like, well, if you technically do macro track and calorie count, you become aware of how much is in everything. So it's in one point, it like, it does become intuitive when you develop that base level. You're like, I'm aware of how much I'm having. I'm aware if I have like four tablespoons of peanut butter, then technically like, I'm going to be really full later. So maybe I do two tablespoons, like, as opposed to being like, I can't have peanut butter at all. Um, but the thing that I think would be really interesting to hear is how did you for yourself begin to transition to this new set of tools? Like it, you know, it's kind of like when someone's like, okay, so you're saying I, I'm finding calorie counting is, is maybe, maybe mentally it's harmful for me at this point. Should mm -hmm. I just stop counting altogether? Yeah. I, I, I know how I might approach that, but I would love to hear how you might guide someone through that process. Yeah. So my own journey through it, um, basically, like I said, I had a, I had a background in tracking. Uh, when I initially started coaching, I was doing meal plans, pulled away from that, switched to just tracking um and did it myself like had a lot of success doing it myself uh but kind of a common theme for i mean most of my life especially my, my adult life is that i loved i love to eat i have an athletic background i was a swimmer growing up and into college and I mean, I guess this is a good thing. It, it, you know, it's the other side of the coin. You have some people that grow up in athletic backgrounds and they're super body conscious and uh, they worry about eating too much. But being a swimmer, it's like it, it's like an eating competition. Like <laughs> we just we ate. We we're bottomless pits. And uh, so um, not a lot of issues with regards to I mean, some issues with body image, but not a ton. And I just I liked to eat a ton of food. And so once I stopped doing that, I just found it was really difficult for me to regulate my own hunger and fullness. And I was that person who would go to parties and social gatherings and holiday events and have this like mental talk with myself, like, I'm not going to overeat. I feel like crap when I do it and then go and overeat and feel like crap, like just this horrible cycle. And I felt totally out of control. And then, you know, you learn how to track macros and it, it, it kind of stops because again, you have that like piece of accountability, but then when you're not tracking, it, it all came back. And so I felt like this, it, this isn't actually solving my problem. I need to figure out something else. And so um, had my son went through all of that stuff. And I, when I had my son, I feel like that was a big turning point for me in just evaluating, like, what do I want to do? How do I want to spend my time? Um, and you, you go through the whole, like your body changes when you're pregnant and everything like that. And after having him, I, um, knew that like, I've, I wanted to lose weight, but I didn't want to do it in a really like negative way. Um, and so I took my time doing that. And that was, I think a really good thing for me is like, I just, for me, having him made me realize like there are other things in life that are more important than like tracking all of your macros <laughs> and not to say that my health isn't important because it totally is, 
but I was in no rush to like get the weight off as fast as possible. I was like, okay, I'm just going to take it slow and make sure that I have time to like enjoy this phase of my life as well as, you know, like do what I can to make myself feel better. And so I kind of let tracking go and started to explore other ways of eating and just like kind of pulling back, like, pulling in those principles that I knew, uh, helped me, you know, when it came to tracking, like, yeah, I know how to build a balanced plate. I know I should be eating protein, uh, with most of my meals. And I know that when I do these things, I actually do eat better and I do feel better. And so I'm just going to kind of follow those principles. So that was kind of the start of it. And then, um, then I would say, I still kind of struggled a little bit with like, overeating in certain situations. And so at a certain point, I ultimately was just like, I'm going to completely take weight loss off the table. Like, I don't even want to try. I don't even want to think about it. I am fully going to go all in on just like figuring out my hunger cues and like giving myself full reign of whatever, which (laughs) feels a little bit scary. Uh, And it was hard, but, and and I'll say like, I did it for probably it probably took me like five or six months. I gained like 15 to 20 pounds in that time frame. Uh, but now I'm like, it's not an issue, which I never, ever, ever thought that I would be that person. You know, when you go to the parties and you're like full all the time and overeating all the time, I just was like, I, I would look at people that were sitting in front of a plate of cookies or chips or whatever and not eating them. <laughs> And I was like, how could I ever, I will never be that person. That's how I felt. Like I will never, ever be that person. Um, But through that whole journey, that's kind of how I learned, like, um, essentially that there is a lot that comes into play when it comes to like your relationship with food, your hunger cues, your fullness cues, everything like that. And for me, like giving myself permission to eat uh, having, you know, a little bit more of like a laid back approach was actually really helpful. And so that's when I started using it with my clients too, of like, okay, um, we can still approach this with a weight loss goal in mind, if that's something that you want to do. Uh, but we also, I, I feel like the intensity that a lot of people approach fat loss with can be detrimental in the long run. Not always, But especially if they're seeking balance, which a lot of my clientele are, you know, a lot of them are young moms and they've got kids and they're coming to me, you know, saying the same thing you said of like, oh my gosh, I I can't do this forever. Like (laughs) they're feeling overwhelmed. Uh, So having that approach and saying like, okay, like we can scale back and it's still going to be just fine. And that's going to allow you to... essentially like find the path for yourself that works really well. Um, so that's, yeah. I <laughs> No, I think it, I, I, Ali, I think exactly what you're saying is what people need to hear because here you are someone who is coaching other people, how to do this. You make your living doing this and you're also having the internal struggle of releasing some of the reins to be able to discover what you are truly capable of doing within your own life. And how amazing is it that throughout that journey, you then have an understanding or a better understanding of what it actually might feel like for a client who is being introduced to this. I I am a huge proponent of not coaching other people or not having other people do something unless I've experienced it myself. If we look at it from like a training perspective, because I know you also love training and that's pretty much you're an athlete, you're, you know, there's an awesome, um, he is. He's, he's got a podcast called The Forever Athlete. He calls it, the, Corey Camp, he calls it The Forever Athlete, right? That's kind of what you are. And I am not an Olympic weightlifting person. I, I could do cleans if I wanted to. I would never take on a client who wanted to specialize or learn how to like do Olympic lifting. That just makes no sense. So, you know, it's, it's it's amazing that you were able to do that and experience that. So I want you, I, I just want to shine a light on that because I don't know if people can recognize 
as a coach, how hard it is to take the thing you've been doing for so long and completely like throw it out and start all over again. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's just beautiful, a beautiful part of your journey. And I re I really, I really enjoy that. And I think that's so rad um, to notice or to be able to talk about. I'm sure you can empathize too, like with just how helpful it is as a coach to go through those things and to feel all of the, like the emotional roller coaster of all of it, because then your clients come to you and they're like, oh my gosh, uh, what am I doing wrong? Or maybe we should backpedal. Maybe we should switch gears. And you're like, listen, I know, like I've been there. I have felt those same feelings and hang in there. Like you're, you're going to get through this. Cause like hundred percent, like during that time where I was like, going all in and just giving myself permission to eat whatever there were multiple times where i was like mm, maybe i should cut maybe i should <laughs> maybe i should put myself back in a deficit and uh, uh being able to just like make that decision deliberately multiple times like nope stay in it like you're not done yet hang in there like that's a hard decision to make and i had so many clients go through it too yeah, I mean, it's, it's so challenging. I mean, for me, I'll, I'll give two examples for me in the world of like training, like my own training. Uh, I've done it where I've burnt out, like I completely burnt, burnt out. I was like training twice a day. I was traveling, teaching seminars, leading workshops, teaching people how not to do what I was currently doing to myself. <laughs> Uh, I was probably like physically in the best shape of my life to date. However, like my sleep was horrible. My heart rate was horrible. <laughs> my, my eating habits were very like rigid. I was solely focused on like, I got to eat enough protein. I got to do enough. I got to do X or Y. Like I need, I need to do this or that. And then I went to like the other end of the spectrum where it's like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to get really into like, trail racing and going outside and not really caring about how many sets and reps I do and just like the total other end of the spectrum where it's just like, I'm just going to be loosey goosey about this all together. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it probably took me until maybe January of this year to be like, okay, I can start adding in like sets and reps again and having like, I want to hit this goal or this goal. Um, and you know, so that's one end of it. And the other end of it with like nutrition and stuff, it's like, I grew up a really skinny, lanky kid who was bullied by kids who were younger than him. You know, I, I wasn't the most athletic kid. I didn't even enjoy it. Um, and then in college, I kind of found fitness. And in one summer, I went from weighing like 119 pounds to 165 pounds. Like I just started to eat and lift. And that's all I did. And that was like, almost 15 years ago, yeah. 14 years ago. So it's like, you know, my journey with nutrition has been kind of like all over the place because I'm also type one diabetic. So it's like a lot of the things I was told to do. I was like, well, this is messing with my diabetes, but boy, do I feel like a superhero right now. So let's kind of ignore what my body's telling me, you know? So it's this, it's this weird tightrope walk to be able to navigate that and feel like okay i have an understanding now but it makes it that much easier when you then work with a client who's like hey i'm feeling this way mm -hmm. oh, i could totally empathize with that i could totally begin to to do this and for me what makes it hard personally and this is a question i want to ask you is like i can recognize i suffer from perfectionism mm -hmm. i say i'm a recovering perfectionist and I think it was my therapist who told me this once. And I really, I, per perfectionism is just like procrastination. It's just like, it, it's just like going away from the thing that's actually really hard, but might actually give you the thing that you're looking for. And mm -hmm. I, my question for you is for someone, for someone who's maybe making a transition, who wants to be more mindful, but maybe struggles with perfectionism, struggles with the idea that they need to get to a specific size, in this amount of time that they need to to eliminate a specific thing to get the result even faster like how do you even begin that conversation like how do you even like what is the like tangible starting point for someone to navigate through that yes this is a good question because this i feel like is one of the biggest 
struggles that people have with that switch to mindful eating, especially if they come from tracking to switching to mindful eating, they've got something that's very concrete, very cut and dry, like you hit your numbers or you don't, right? And then they go to mindful eating and they're, it's just, it feels so abstract. They're like, how do I even measure if I'm doing well? I don't know. Uh, it's hard. Cause like I said, you're not going to be perfect at all the principles every single day. And that doesn't mean that you're doing poorly either. Right. <laughs> so it's super difficult for them. Um, but we kind of tried to lean into that like abstractness a little bit and also help them to recognize like big picture. Okay. Let's sit down. Let's figure out what do you want to accomplish? How do you want to feel? How do you want to feel around food? Uh, what are some examples of wins, whether that's I went to a party and I didn't overeat dessert or, um, I went out to eat, but, um, like I didn't have too many drinks or whatever it may be. Uh, I have another client who's saying she goes through the drive through a lot with her kids. And she's like, I'm always eating in the car. And she set a goal to not eat in the car anymore. She'd wait till she got home so she could eat at the table. And so something like that was really a big deal for her. So we kind of pull in those things. Like what are some things that maybe you're really struggling with that you want to get better at? And we write them down. And then we follow up with those kinds of things. And the other thing that we pull in a lot of times is values. And so we establish like, what are your values? Um, and maybe that's family, maybe it's fitness, health. Uh, it can be something like uh, being adventurous, uh, being connected, those types of things. And then we spell out what could that look like? So if you were in a certain situation, maybe your husband comes home, he got a big promotion, you guys want to go out and celebrate, but you also, maybe you went out to lunch earlier that day, you're not that hungry, whatever it may be. Like, how can you honor your value of being connected and celebrating family while still honoring your value of health, right? And so we kind of go through like role play of how, how could we handle that situation and what would feel really good to you. So then they have some strategies in their head of how to cope. And then they can bring that up when we check in on a weekly basis of like, okay, what happened this week? Um, and how did you feel about it? And uh, what's interesting too, that I see a lot of times is they'll maybe set a goal. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to lift four times this week. And then they'll come back the next week and they'll be like, okay, I didn't lift four times. I only lifted three times. However, I went on a really long walk on the weekend with my kids. So I just kind of counted that. And I'm like, that is, that's perfect. Like maybe you didn't hit your goal. However, you still acted in alignment with your values and you feel great about it. Right? So that's when you have that big picture of your values, it kind of helps you when it's like, oh, maybe you didn't check the box, but you still like mission accomplished at the end of the day still. Yeah, I absolutely love that, especially because a lot of my clients, they know I say this, I, I love goals, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I think they're overrated. I think they really cloud your judgment sometimes especially when it's like, okay, I really want to look this way, or I really want to be ready for this event, or I, and unless you're technically like a professional athlete, the way I view it, right? Uh, the way I view it is, is you have to understand where you're coming from and where you're at and what your life is giving you. And the thing that starts to happen is we really, really undermine or don't recognize like the small things, the mm -hmm. things that actually matter a lot, the things that are actually most important. And when we can start to do that, you start to notice these things that pop up like all the time. Like I'm sure, Ali, you've had it where a client comes in and they say something that like they're like, oh, yeah. And anyway, I like I parked further away and I walked into the store like and you're just like oh, that's great yeah they act like 
feel like we're so quick to diminish our small accomplishments. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I guess in hearing that it's, it's for you maybe personally, like, how do you, how do you choose to celebrate your accomplishments? Like, how do you choose to celebrate the, the victories you have right now? Like if folks are following you on Instagram, which they should be doing because you're posting some quality content that explains a lot of these concepts really, really well, but also shines a light on like your own journey right now as I don't know, your, your, your baby might show up on this call. I don't really know. I, I don't know your due date, but, but for those people out there who are currently trying to figure this out for themselves, like how do you choose to celebrate right now currently? Cause how you celebrate now might be very different than how you celebrated like five years ago, six years ago. Totally different. And Again, I think that's like how much it just shows how much my perspective has shifted as I've gotten older, as I've become a mom, like your priorities shift too. And me before kids was like, you know, work out five, six days a week. I loved it. I was, I was working a ton too. So it's like, I'd work overtime and it's just like, yeah, I'm happy to do it. And now it's, it's totally different in so many senses. And I'm like you, I would call myself a recovering perfectionist. And so missing workouts was hard for me back then. Um, and then I would beat myself up about it. And so now I feel like I do a much better job of just like celebrating the little things and then also like recognizing when I'm doing my best and that's okay. Like. And I tell my clients this all the time, your best is different than the best, right? So the best or, you know, what's the best on paper might look like one thing, but your best might look different and your best might look different from day to day. So, I mean, obviously that requires some level of accountability and being honest with yourself. Uh, but I also think people overthink that too. And they think, oh my gosh, am I, I don't know. And it's like, you know, like, be honest with yourself. <laughs> you know, if you're actually trying, you know, if you, you know, had the capacity to do something you, you didn't or whatever it may be. So ultimately for me, um, that can be something as small as like last night, I, uh, got done, working and I was just like catching up on listening to Marco Polo's from my friends and my friend had been on a walk and I was like, I want to go on a walk, which walking is hard for me these days. <laughs> so, um, but I was like, I want to go on a walk. So I like put shoes on, I took my dog and we went on a walk and that felt like a, like for me, that felt like a big deal, which me pre-pregnancy, like that would be no big deal. I did that all the time. And it was, easy and I was getting 10,000 plus steps a day. And, but now that feels like a big deal. It's hard for me to do. So I was proud of myself and I went to bed and I was like, you know, uh, my fitness looks way different than it did even a year ago. Uh, but that was something I haven't done and I haven't always been able to do, especially in the last few weeks. And so I was proud of it. And then there are other moments where, you know, it's those small moments of progress where, just recognizing I went to my parents' house. I don't know what it is about going to my parents' house. I don't know if you're listening. Like when I go to my parents' house, I don't, I turn 15 again. I eat like I'm 15 again. <laughs> and so uh, like going to dinner at my parents' house and not eating to the point where I felt feel sick, like that feels like a big deal to me because that's a habit of mine. So just recognizing those small moments and being proud of it. I think is really, really helpful because again, that puts you in the mindset of like, I can do this. I I'm a capable person. I'm capable of change. And so if I can do this, if I can go to my parents and not overeat, or I can prioritize a walk, even when I might feel kind of tired and it's hard, uh, then I can do other things when life gets crazy. Ah, uh, I love that. I love it because because success truly exists on like a sliding scale. And we don't like to look at it that way because then it means like if I didn't get the gold medal at the Olympics, it was all pointless. But right. it's like, wait a minute, I'm not even competing in the Olympics. Why am I, <laughs> why am I, why am I setting my standard at Michael Phelps level? Or, you know, why am I trying to go about it this way? And a lot of it has to do with society and pressure and, 
other stuff. So I really love the concept of of celebrating where you're at and what's showing up for you and how important that is. And you know, what when you think about it, when you stop and think about it, technically, however old you are, you know, I'm I'm 32. So I have 32 years of pre-programmed things going through my head at all times. If we look at it and say in six weeks, in 12 weeks, that I'm supposed to unprogram all of that, that's not very realistic. And no. it's not it's not really giving ourselves enough credit. Because if we look at it like one year, two years, you can get a lot done. Because it's usually really small stuff that that starts to lay the foundation. It's like we usually miss out on that. We usually don't see that like, oh, wow, what can I get done in a year? Oh, wow. What's what's different? What's different in the last six months? Not what what's different from like what's different in the last six months? Like how how is life starting to shift uh, for me? How are things starting to work for me as opposed to against me? And um, I saw that you you specialize in a lot of like health mindset stuff. And I feel like that's probably like a big conversation around starting to move those rocks, starting to chip away at that. I don't know, Allie, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, mindset's everything. And I mean, I'm a dietitian, so went to school, studied nutrition. And even just in my beginning years of practicing, and then as I've matured, what you realize is obviously nutrition principles are important and you got to be teaching people the right principles and everything. But also those are kind of useless if you can also coach people in behavior change. Because <laughs> that's ultimately what you're doing is coaching people in behavior change. That's freaking hard. I'm like, man, I, sh I had some friends that had like psychology minors. I'm like, I should have done that too <laughs> because there's a lot of that. So um, no behavior changes everything. And that shift does take time. And that's something we have to remind our clients of often is like, Hey, you may have been doing this for years, if not decades, right? The way you've been thinking about food, the way you've talked about food, um, the way you act around food, fitness, like whatever it may be. And we're not just going to do that in 12 weeks or eight weeks. Cause yeah, I mean, I had my son at, I was 28 and he'll be four this year. So yeah, I'm 32. And I feel like that, like I said, was a big turning point for me and totally shifted. And I'm still, I'm still changing and growing. And even hearing you talk about how much you shifted from one side of the spectrum to the other, like we're professionals in this field. We're coaches. We know a lot of the ins and outs of this, and we're probably more aware about our behavior than the average person. <laughs> uh, and we've both kind of run the gamut of our experiences and our positions and everything like that. And it just goes to show like your growth never stops if you don't let it. <laughs> and uh, you can always change, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, I think. I think that that's really important to highlight what you just said, like that truly you're never going to stop. Like you, you never will. And the moment you do stop, the moment you stop allowing yourself to be curious or to wanting to figure things out, it's kind of when you feel stuck. And that's usually when you go back to the things that you were doing that you tried to get break out of doing, you mm -hmm. know, that, that, that's, that's really the one thing that I've noticed. Uh, in working with clients and even with myself, it's like if if I'm not allowing myself to be wrong or mm -hmm. to make mistakes, then I'm not actually going to learn and be able to help people. Like if 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 I'm so and this is an interesting topic, probably just talking to you, too. If I if I were to become, let's say, like I'll pick something. I'll, all right. Let's say I was like a keto zealot and I was like, all right, everyone's got to do this if they want to live forever, right? If I wanted to go that route. And then research comes out, which research is out. That's like, you, do, you know, that's not really the best thing for everyone. People with seizures, people possibly with specific cancers, like maybe, maybe that really helps in those situations. But even then, the ketogenic diet isn't typically what's being marketed. You know, those those clinical diets are very different. 
So it's like, okay, if I can acknowledge that, then I can come back and say, you know what, I've learned. I'm, you know what, I, I actually find that this would be most helpful for people or this. And I've done that so many times throughout my career through self experimentation, through learning how to actually read research, to asking questions, to being okay with finding out that I was wrong. You know, it's, there's a lot that goes into it. And I think someone, someone who is on their own health and fitness journey, if you're working with a coach or if you're trying to figure this out by yourself, I think at a certain point you have to play detective. Like you have to, you have to be a detective and figure out like what's working for you, what's not working for you. And then if you can't figure that out, going to someone like Ali or like myself and being like, hey, here's what I've noticed. Here's the big picture. Here's the scene on the wall with all the pictures and I've drawn the lines and connected everything. Like, can you help me figure out how to how to sort of undo this? I think that's really, really important to consider, even if you haven't considered it yet. It's just something interesting to think about. Yeah, I think too, gosh, my mind's going so many different ways, but like talking again about like perfectionism and how that can honestly be so detrimental to your progress, right? Which it's funny because all of us perfectionists think we're doing this and it's helping us and it's serving us in some way. And the reality is it's usually holding you back because it's keeping you from, from thinking outside of the box or trying something new or trying something and maybe not being good at it. And, and then what, right? Because you're so scared of failing that you don't do anything and then nothing happens. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. And then also just, I like what you talked about as, as you're applying new principles, like you might mess up and that might feel really uncomfortable or you might make mistakes or you might find out that you're wrong. Um, and again, that's where, you know, clients often will come to me and be like, well, this is really hard. And often we view that discomfort as a sign that we're doing something wrong and that we need to change or we need to stop or go back to the old way of doing things. And I just like to remind clients like change is hard. Change is really uncomfortable. And so you're probably feeling a lot of that right now. And that's usually a sign that you're growing also. So I just want to reassure you, like everything's okay. Stay the path. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is, this is pretty uncomfy and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, I don't think people like to be uncomfortable. You yeah. know, it makes a lot of sense, but there's that fine line of understanding that the discomfort is actually what is allowing someone to have progress. Like I think James Clear, it's in his book, Atomic Habits, but I'm not sure he's the one who came up with the, the concept of the plateau of latent potential. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah, yeah. Been a while since I've yeah. read the Yeah. Yeah. So, so the idea just for folks, if they haven't read it is basically like, we think the trajectory of us doing things is going to be a straight linear progression. Like we think, all right, day one, mindful eating. I'm going to try five of these, five of these skills or tactics. I'm going to be really good at it. And in a week, I'm going to lose weight and feel satisfied and be comfortable in my own body and not fear Reese's peanut butter cups. Like I'm going to, I'm going to have all of these things in check. And then we look at, we look at the actual chart. What it is, is it's a series of steps where we make progress and then we stink a little bit and we make progress and we learn, or the one that's from the book is it's, you have the straight linear line and we think that's what it is, but what it is, is actually you're doing it and there's a dip. There's like valley. a line and it dips and that's the valley of disappointment. Yeah. And that's where we're like, oh, why am I even bothered doing this? Why am I even trying? What? Uh, all right. I guess I'll keep showing up. And then all of a sudden you burst through that line and it's like, oh, wow, I'm an overnight success. Oh, wow. You got it all figured out. Oh, wow. Al Allie, Allie understands how to understand and honor her hunger and fullness cues. She's got, she's been doing this her whole life. Chris knows how to Chris knows how to train and and understands how to recognize when he's full. He's been doing this his whole life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like we've just we keep going. We yeah. keep going. And that's really what what I hope to inspire in in my clients, in in friends, in you know, it's just how do we 
how do we get there? Like, how do we keep showing up? You know, that, I don't know if you have any tips for that, but like, maybe even for yourself personally, it's like, okay, when I first tried this mindful eating, or even when I first tried this macro counting and, and, and doing all this, like, how did I keep showing up? Like, how did you convince yourself to keep showing up and keep trying? Yeah. I mean, I think it, again, kind of comes back to values and remembering that big picture. Right. And so, you know, in my own journey, I just knew that I had gotten to a point where I was like, I, I do not want to live like this anymore. I am so tired of being in these situations and feeling this way and not feeling like I can trust myself anymore. And it became more important to me than anything else, whether that was like a lean physique or whatever, to just like figure that out and trusting too that like, okay, I've tried a lot of other things. You know, I've tried counting macros. I've tried just being super conscious. Uh, I've tried just eating clean, eating healthy, like whatever it may be. And this isn't working. So, you know, I'm going to try something else. And I also knew like, hey, if this doesn't work out and I want to try like lose weight again or whatever it may be, I've got the tools. I know how to do it. I can get the help. And um, so that's helpful. And then also seeing other people do it. I, I recommend my clients often like look to other people, find examples of what you want your life to be like and who you want to be. And if they can do it, there's evidence that you can do it too. And you can look at other people. You can also look at your own life. And that's another thing I tell my clients, you know, what, think of a time when, you know, there was something that you really struggled with and it was really hard in the beginning and now it's not that hard anymore. Right. So I liken it to like a, like a college course. If you take a course in college at the beginning, you're learning all these principles and you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm so in over my head. Like, I don't know any of this. This is so hard, but over time, you study, you take tests, you learn. And by the end of the semester, you're like, okay, everything you were learning at the beginning of the semester probably feels a lot easier and you feel much more competent, right? But it took a lot of long nights and a lot of time studying and probably, you know, some <laughs> like maybe failed tests or not so great tests and all that stuff. And so, you know, life, nutrition, fitness, it's going to be the same way. There's going to be times where you feel like you're killing it. And then there's going to be times where you're like, mm, I don't know if I'm doing so good, but you can change, right? We can learn and we can grow. And that's the coolest thing about it. Like we know from science that our brains can change and that's awesome. Wow. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm such a big fan of yours, Allie. Like I, I can honestly say this. I'm a huge fan of yours. And I want folks to be able to check check out what you're doing. So um I know you have your I know you have your coaching program and you work one on one with clients. So what would be the best way for folks to be able to follow you and be able to maybe they want to reach out and work with you? Uh what would be the best way for folks to to find out what's going on with you? So I'm mostly on Instagram. I'm just Allie Henry R dot R D on Instagram. Henry's with an IE, Allie's with an IE. And then uh, my website is the same. So it's Allie Henry RD.com. And my website has information about one-on-one -on -one coaching too. And then I also have a mindful eating course and I am in the middle of my first round of that. And then I'll launch again in the fall after I, have my baby and settle into life a little bit more. <laughs> ah, well, I I want to just again thank you so much for taking the time to sit down to sit down and talk. I know we covered like quite a few things, um, but before we wrap up, I just want to ask you one question, and we'll see we'll see what the answer is. If you could go back and talk to yourself right when you started this whole career you could you could choose whether it's like when you're fresh out of school when it when when maybe you went out on your own and started to do this maybe in a more private sort of way what what would you want to tell yourself like what would you what piece of advice would you give yourself maybe i think i'd probably tell myself to relax a little bit <laughs> <laughs> I like had so much intensity towards things. And like I said, I'm, I was such a perfectionist, especially through most of my twenties. And 
Um, I, I don't think I was, I, I mean, I never, like I said, I didn't have huge issues with body image. I never had like eating disorders or anything like that, but it just preoccupied so much of my mind. <laughs> and it's like, you're going to be okay. Like this journey never ends and you're going to be okay. And just have fun too. I think that's the other thing. Like this is, hmm. this isn't supposed to be so intense and horrible all the time. Like it can be fun. Like, it, like you said, my nutrition philosophy at the beginning of the podcast is that this should enhance your life. So if you're going into this and you find that your approach is ruining your relationships, keeping you from doing the things that you really enjoy, then maybe you should reevaluate. Hmm. Yeah. Ah, that's such good advice. Well, you can give it to other people now too. Yes. Uh, but I'm sure your past self appreciates it <laughs> as well. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to just wrap up here. Uh, as always the, in the show notes, you'll be able to find Allie's contact information, how you can, how you can work with her, what you can check out on Instagram. You can also, uh, follow me on Instagram. There'll be a link in the bottom. And as always, if you can give a five-star review, drop a review, greatly appreciated because other people get to listen to this fantastic interview and get to learn a little bit more. So I hope everyone's going to have an amazing day and go do amazing things because you can.